Hello, and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival and tonight's program, Bill Gates, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, which will be moderated by Dax Shepard and Monica Padman. My name is Allegra Berry. I am chair of the board of the Chicago Humanities Festival and an executive vice president of Northern Trust. Given our commitment to corporate social responsibility and philanthropy, we at Northern Trust are delighted to underwrite this program. I would like to thank Seminary Co-op Bookstores and Literati Bookstore for their partnership. And thanks to our captioner for making this event more accessible. All digital events have closed captioning, which can be controlled through YouTube. You can learn more about upcoming events and support the festival at chicagohumanities.org. Now I invite you to watch a special video presented by the Gates Foundation, followed immediately by the discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dak Shepard, Monica Padman, and Bill Gates. In a typical year, the world emits over 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases. And as we keep doing that, the consequences for human life will be catastrophic. When I first fell in love with computers as a teenager, they were enormous, expensive, and only the government and big companies could afford them. But my friends and I became obsessed with a wild idea. What could we do if there was a computer on every desk? And now the wild idea is quite tame. Billions of people not only have computers on their desks, but even in their pockets. Now the world needs another breakthrough. In fact, it needs many breakthroughs. We need to get from 51 billion tons to zero while still meeting the planet's basic needs. That means we need to transform the way we do almost everything. Our commitment to developing these innovations will mean the difference between a future where everyone can live a healthy, productive life and one where we're constantly dealing with the human and financial crises at a historic scale. Entrepreneurs and investors have to build new businesses and change existing businesses to get these solutions deployed. Government leaders have to enact new policies that drive the market for clean energy. And advocates have to keep their voices loud to hold all of us accountable for rapid progress. Avoiding a climate disaster will be one of the greatest challenges humans have ever taken on. Greater than landing on the moon, greater than eradicating smallpox, even greater than putting a computer on every desk. Now my basic optimism about climate change comes from my belief in innovation. It's our power to invent that makes me hopeful. Party time. Wow. What a video. That felt like we were at the Olympics. It did. It had kind of an Olympic feel to it. Um, we're so excited to talk to you again. We would you're, This book could be terrible, and we still would have agreed to talk to you and help you promote it. So that's how much it's we okay. love okay. <laughs> uh, but it's not. It's wonderful. It, it is okay. wonderful. Um, I have to say, I think I'm a pretty good person to, uh, well, first, let me just thank the Chicago uh, Humanities Festival for having all of us. It's um, an incredible yeah. honor. Yes. Um, I don't know that you picked the right two people, probably Monica, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> I want to say, Bill, that um, I think I'm a great person to ask you about this book because I'm very much a defeatist. I've not ever really engaged in this topic. I felt like the solutions that were being presented were naive that somehow if we all picked the right car that would actually address this problem i thought the 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 responsibility was being put so much on the individual shoulders and it feels like it's a much bigger problem than that so i enjoyed your book so much and it really really got me engaged because i think it's the first time i've heard a breakdown that really encompasses everything we're up against and the many solutions and, and, and most importantly, very pragmatic solutions that have to happen for us to address this. So I guess my first question for you is, why even throw your hat in this ring? Why would you write a book about this topic? Well, we have two things that are amazing. We have this goal uh, to get to zero by 2050 which is because this is gonna be hard to do, uh, the earliest we can get it done. 
And we have a young generation that's beginning to really speak out uh, and say that this is a moral cause to them beyond their own individual uh, success. And hopefully as that strengthens, we're seeing it you know, throughout the country, both parties, even throughout the world. So when you have those two things, you want to have a plan to go with it. And yet, because most people aren't aware of all these sources of emissions or the scale of emissions and you know the demanding nature of getting to zero, which means you can't just pick the easy things, you have to pick everything that does emissions and you can't just pick a few countries that you know use brute force and pay you know huge amounts to do it. You actually have to come up with uh, green products that will be adopted by all the countries, including middle-income countries like India that have yet to provide basic shelter or lighting or you know now they need air conditioning. And so I thought, okay, I can contribute to the framework for a plan and the key metrics, uh, which we'll probably touch on this idea of the green premium where you're paying extra for the clean stuff and that, that that's way too high and we need innovators to bring that down. And so, you know, I saw the effects of climate change as I traveled in Africa after the year 2000. Uh, after 2005, I got educated. Uh, 2010, I gave a TED talk about it, not as famous as my 2015 pandemic TED talk, uh, but it's only in the last few years that I've seen this energy around the topic that made me think, okay, uh, I'll, I'll help contribute to the discussion about a plan. And it you know, looks like it's fairly timely because we have a US administration, Europe, UK, we've got a big climate meeting in November. So uh, you know, I, I hope it, it pushes the thinking forward. Yeah, so I, I think that, the, like you say, that the younger generation is incredibly passionate about this topic, as they should be. It'll affect them the most and their children. But um, there has yet to be, from my perspective, a really tactical approach. There's a lot of passion, but I've not seen it broken down. And so just one thing I want to point out is I just love how you think. I feel like everything is <laughs> just reverse engineered and maybe I'm wrong about that assumption but it's just I love how you take us through it globally okay there's 51 billion tons of emissions happening by the way you were excited to say cow fart a lot in the book <laughs> and I'm excited to say emissions a lot tonight so oh, just boy. neither here nor we're there. only nine minutes in <laughs> yeah we <got> so, <laughs> uh <laughs> But I think it's such a great way to just go, okay, here's the issue, 51 uh, billion tons. What's making the 51 billion tons? And um, I think you have a really sexy pie chart that really breaks this down for us that I would love to take a look at because I think it'll be shocking for a lot of people where it's coming from. I think most people off the cuff would imagine it's all transportation or it's all uh, electricity, but it's a lot of things that are surprising. Yeah, great. Let's put that uh, pie chart up because I, I really hope the takeaways from the book are, you know, the 51 billion, the zero, and then all these different sources. As you say, the two that people are quite aware of are uh, that one at the bottom there, electricity, 27%, and that's as we burn coal and we burn natural gas to make the electricity. Uh, the second sector that they're mostly aware of transportation uh, or there on the left. And you see passenger cars is the biggest piece of that. But you've also got planes, buses, trucks, and ships, which are much harder to solve uh, because the total energy they use is much higher than a passenger car. Uh, but then we have these three other segments that are pretty low awareness. Agriculture, that includes the cow, uh, farts, and burps. There we go. Uh, that are actually uh, methane gas. That's a powerful greenhouse gas. It's making fertilizer. It's uh, uh, countries where they're cutting down the forest, and that releases uh, carbon. It's even garbage dumps that also emit methane. Uh, then we have heating and cooling buildings. Today in the U.S., a lot of that's natural gas uh, that creates emissions. But the biggest piece of this pie, that 31% there. That's this physical economy. Uh, 
You know, every building you look at has got steel and cement in it. Your car is steel. Your road is cement. There's a lot of that uh, that the world manufactures. In fact, those are the two, by tonnage, two biggest human activities there are. And then everything else like plastic, uh, uh, paper, various uh, chemically derived products add to that. And so we've got to change and get green steel. We've got to get green cement uh, to go along with all those, those other pieces. And that's why it's daunting is that not only do we have to figure out how to make those green things without a huge price premium, and then we have to roll that out to the steel factories all over the world, uh, including India, China, everywhere, not just in the US. So we're gonna have to use every one of these 30 years uh, that we have remaining in a, a very uh, intense way. Yeah, and I, I think what's interesting and important is that we don't get stuck in like, oh, 10 years ago we said no plastics and now oh, actually we may be able, well, just earlier, I was like, oh, we gotta bring these water bottles. We can't bring plastic water bottles because we're talking about climate. And, and Dax was like, well, actually, maybe plastic is going to end up being a solution. Because it traps the carbon in the process of making it and perhaps it could trap even more and be a storage device for carbon which was again this is why i love the book is all these things that are are kind of knee-jerk and popular they get a real trial what what is it what does it do what does it cost all you know this approach i love and i just want to point one thing out because another thing that's always kind of rubbed me the wrong way about the, the environmental movement is just it seems to be intrinsically anti-development, which troubles me. And what I love in the book is you point out uh, Shanghai. Uh, when you see the difference between Shanghai 15 years ago and today, it's, it's startling. And that, and that represents so much steel and cement, which you talk about, which is troubling. But it also represents education, higher standard of living, increased life expectancy. So these are goals that we should have. And, and I'm so refreshed by the fact that your approach is, no, we want this stuff. We want the, we want to be have air conditioning that's not destroying us. We want these things and we gotta figure out how to have them, yes. So. Yeah, air conditioning's a good one because we actually need more of it to deal with the, even the warming we'll get, uh, you know, and actually the US today is the only country that has extensive air conditioning. Other countries need to, do that, uh, but you know, using uh, green electricity so that it, it doesn't make the problem even even worse. But you're right; it's the basic needs that uh, you know we take for granted that a lot of the world hasn't gotten yet. the The U.S. the rich countries can cut back, and that helps a bit. But it's not a path to zero. Uh, if you cut back, you can help us get there sooner. Uh, you can reduce some of the emissions, but uh, asking India to cut back, uh, that's completely unfair. Uh, you know, we should feel good that we'll figure out how they get what some of what we have, uh, but without a greenhouse gas footprint. Okay, so now here's where I want to bring up why I think you are so uniquely positioned to have a fresh take on this, which is just given your history with the business you built, which is you created something that had not previously existed. And I think you have an optimism about innovation that I can't even really relate to. Um, and then of course, because you brought so many actual products to market, your comprehension of the economical forces and what it'll take are so um, relevant to this conversation because you never ever look at one of these things and just say, yeah, that makes sense to spend a dollar to save five cents of electricity. You go, that that model would never work in the real world. So just, could you tell me how it is uh, a proprietary look at this to, to really be factoring in all these economic forces? Well, the private sector, you know, works to drive innovation. You have to have, of course, government setting the rules, uh, but, uh, you know, it's happened over the last 200 years with electricity and now uh, digital things and improved medicines. In a way, we'd like to repeat that. 
Uh, you know, so the U.S. has led in innovation with computers and digital, uh, you know, which is why we can do events like this, even though we have a pandemic uh, going on. It's led in health products, and that creates companies that create jobs. They do exports. We need to reprise that for a lot of these areas where the U.S. innovation power, universities, national labs, risk-taking capital, uh, you know, tuned venture capital to this climate problem, step up and not only make these products cheap enough for the U.S. Uh, to say, okay, we'll go green, but make it possible for the entire world. So what we owe the world is not just to reduce our emissions to zero. We owe the world uh, our share, which is a large share of that innovation, so that they can do it too. Uh, if we just write big checks, I'm not sure we'd be willing, but if you go about it that way, it doesn't, it only affects our 15%. And you know, right now we're trying to get China and India to make strong commitments. They're waiting to see what the price will be uh, as they're dealing with uh, you know, citizens who aren't nearly as well off uh, on average as we are. And so the, the fact that the last four years we didn't have that R&D increase and we weren't pushing to buy these green products, you know, we'll look back on that as somewhat wasted time uh, that we can hardly afford. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You want to say the Esther pandemic question? It's really good. Oh, I have a you were really good of? question. Yeah. Um, no, actually, first, I just, I want, I feel like there's so many uh, big words around climate change and climate disaster that people pretend they know but don't know and when they're in these conversations they're like yeah methane carbon yeah um so i was wondering if you could kind of break down especially green premiums because i don't think people really actually know about that and if you could break that down for us yeah so i've got two examples on a, a slide here uh but it applies to all these services you know how much more do you pay uh for the product or service that has no emissions um, you know, with an electric car, uh, you pay a bit more up front, uh, you give up some range, you know, the charge times are higher, there's less charging points. Uh, and so if you look at that right now, I'm comparing to Chevrolet products, uh, you're paying about 15% more to go electric. Uh, now there's a tax incentive that helps with that. And there's now scale and competition. You know, Tesla's led the way and the other manufacturers are going, wow, we need to uh, learn from what they did and, and catch up uh, and compete with that. And so over the next 10 or 15 years, those batteries will get cheaper. So the range will go up, the cost will go down, and the charging speed will go down to 15 minutes. There'll be more charge points. And so we can say this will be the first category of all the emissions where in 10 to 15 years, that green premium will actually be zero. Without any government help, the electric car will be as attractive uh, to the consumer as the gasoline car was. And that's why you'll see uh, a very important Detroit company uh, whose CEO I was talking to earlier today, uh, Mary Barra, who declared that by 2035, uh, they uh, see themselves making only electric cars, which, you know, that really stunned people because GM, you know, the gasoline car and GM, GM and Ford are sort of the two you know, hey, we, we built this world uh, type companies and now, you know, they're saying, okay, they're going to change. Is it true, though, that when you do the um, Tokyo Humani Humanities Festival, you'll show a Toyota slide? I feel like because <laughs> Detroit is part of this festival, we got Chevrolet, which was very clever. <laughs> well, the Chevrolet's, the Chevrolet's in the book. Uh, it is, it is. You know, I have to plead guilty that my first car was a Porsche, and so when I went to get an electric car, uh, I was glad that they had one available. Uh, but there's lots of good choices. And, you know, Tesla's led the way uh, in showing you, you can make a great electric car. I think there is a lot of guilt around this because, like, people want you, you being exhibit A, want, yeah, like, fancy car. Well, no, you just grew up in, in, Detroit. in Detroit. This is what happens. You yeah. grow up with these... Um, you know, dreams of having these certain cars. And then it feels like, oh, I can't have that. Then there's a lot of guilt that I think comes with it. Shaming. And shaming. Yeah, and yeah. so it, <laughs> it's an emotional component, I think, to this where people are like, I don't want to deal with climate change because I don't want to deal with the guilt associated. 
Well, that's exactly why I love your book is it's not in either of these bipartisan silos I've seen this topic approached in. Uh, just like, as I said, the fact that you are, are, are pro-development, pro-education, all these things we know we want. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the, the real hurdles because they were news to me. First off, right out of the gates in the book, I, I guess when I thought of the time period when crocodiles existed north of the, uh, the Arctic Circle, uh, that, that must have represented a, a difference in, in temperature of like 40 degrees. So right out of the gates, I realized, oh, this is much, <laughs> a, a small change has a huge impact. So just tell us the, the gravity of these, this small incremental change. Yeah, so if, you know, if the Earth was even three degrees cooler, uh, you know, human life uh, would not have, you know, come, come to be and thrived like we have. So these temperatures really affect ice, uh, sea level, uh, and, you know, particularly whether the equator is, is habitable. And at times it hasn't been. You know, when people say this is bad for the planet, they don't really mean the planet. I mean, you know, the big ball of, of rock, uh, it's going to be fine. What they mean is that the, the natural ecosystems and the humans who live on the surface of this planet, we're going to be in trouble. Now, the planet, you know, 10 or 20 mil, million years from now can evolve back some coral reefs and hopefully uh, beings more intelligent uh, than us. Uh, but in terms of any reasonable time frame, the destruction going on here, because we're driving the temperature up very, very quickly. Uh, you know, this, we haven't seen in natural history this type of temperature forcing. And it's that speed that means that evolution can't keep up. The birds don't know where to migrate to. The corals don't know how to form their uh, outer shell. And so they, they just get up, they, they bleach, and they die. And the dramatic nature of that, that CO2 rise uh, is putting us in very uncharted territory. Uh, but you know, it means the ice will melt, the seas will get higher, the wildfires will come, and at the equator, you won't be able to do farming. And so all the, the farmers, which are most of the people in those uh, developing countries, there will be incredible unrest, you know, 20 times worse than the civil a Syrian civil war where people will be migrating to the parts of the earth where you can still grow food. And, you know, that is one of the greatest security uh, stability risks that we run. And yet, you know, if you wait till it happens in this case, you can't do something like, uh, you know, just invent a vaccine and then wait a couple of years and it goes away. This one, because of the scale and the variety of activities, you have to be smart enough to anticipate that the bad stuff you're seeing now will be so acute in the rest of this century that you're willing to invest to drive that innovation cycle and get that green premium down in a, in a very broad way. Yeah, I think comprehending the timeline is essential for this. And I do think it's, as you point out, it's, it's self-accelerating in that as it gets warmer, right, marshlands now emit more methane, which warms the atmosphere 28 times as much as carbon. So it, it just kind of, <clears throat> it really ramps up, as you say. Um, but let's talk about um, really quick some of the, the, the crazy challenges and, and, and just my gratitude that you have breakthrough energy working on this. So the electricity issue, you point out, you know, we have this huge problem of intermittency. We can't have the whole world run on solar and wind uh, because of the seasons change, uh, daylight changes, we can't store it well. Uh, there's not really even looking like a future where we'll ever be able to store it incredibly efficiently. So then we, again, I think it's your reverse engineering where it's like, okay, well then what's left? Well, nuclear's left and people hate nuclear. Why do they hate nuclear? Well, it creates race, okay. What else do they hate about it? Well, it melts down. That's an issue for me. And, and so you, your approach to that, I would love for you to walk people through because I think it's, 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 it's gangster. So electricity is super, super important because it's really the main source of energy that we do see a path to make it completely green. 
So the incredible price reduction in solar and wind is key to solving this problem because in the future, like 80% of all the electricity production will be those renewable sources. The reason we can't go to 100% is exactly what you said, which is that when, when you do get a cold front over uh, the Midwest, uh, those you don't tend not to get sun or wind. Now, that's not what happened in Texas a few weeks ago. That was more about a failure to weatherwise. Uh, so there's three things that'll, that'll improve that reliability. We will have some storage, but not enough to bear the whole thing. Uh, we'll have some nuclear fission, which is not weather dependent and is green. And then third, we'll have more transmission. We're very lucky that the US is a big country. And so if you have electric transmission lines all over the country, uh, which we, it's very limited what we have today. In fact, Texas is kind of isolated. There's the West grid and the East grid and the Texas grid. So they couldn't call on other states when they had production messed up and they had people getting cold. Uh, they had to deal with it just themselves. In the future, we'll have you know, 10 times as much transmission. So if the wind is blowing off the East Coast, then uh, power can move into the Midwest. If the Midwest is windy, but uh, the, the coastal wind is not running, then the power will move. We have that today between Washington and California where you'll have wind in California, in Washington sometimes we'll go to California for parts of the day, and then the sun in California uh, will go north. So that transmission line actually sometimes goes one way and sometimes goes the other. Now getting transmission permitted and people feeling good about it being uh, nearby, that's tricky. Uh, that's not nearly as tricky as uh, helping people uh, get comfortable with nuclear, which unless the storage thing, it, it, the costs come down and the scale goes up way beyond what I personally expect, we will have to have that scalable uh, weather independent source. And so I, you know, I'm investing in a company and I'm not the only one, but uh, we got uh, support from the government where the private side uh, pays half and the government pays half. And in five years, we hope to have a reactor uh, with any luck that the cost, the safety, the waste, all the key issues uh, have been dramatically improved. But you know, we have to pursue every angle uh, so we can have this grid that will pr be providing three times as much energy because your car will use electricity, the heating of your house instead of natural gas will use electricity. Even some of these industrial processes like making uh, plastic or, or paper, a lot of those will switch uh, from hydrocarbons to electricity as their energy input. So that's a mammoth task uh, and we have to model it out to make sure that everybody gets to stay warm even in tough weather conditions. Yeah, so, you know, Texas is uh, unfortunate for them. This is the perfect time to talk about the grid because what, what an uh, example of not being linked to some national grid. And um, so that, I guess, brings us uh, seamlessly to the, the government's going to have to really uh, do some stuff, right? We, 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 there's not going to be a privateer that's going to make a nationalized uh, power grid, right? We're going to have to have some major Manhattan Project level dedication to this. Yeah, so the, the it's a mix of the government and the private sector. If you can clear the right of ways, actually, then a lot of the construction and financial risk uh, with the appropriate government framework, the private sector is willing to do. But Getting that permitting, you know, has been tough enough that even some very obvious transmission projects like Canada Hydro coming down into New England or there was a line that was going to go from Oklahoma to Tennessee that would have brought lots of wind power out of Oklahoma and, and benefited both the source and the, the destination there. And so I have to look at what's held that back because we're going to want to make it attractive, including uh, how the the permitting gets streamlined, uh, hopefully as part of this build back better that the Biden administration is talking about. You want high paying jobs, you want people to have a sense that okay, if hydrocarbons are tending down, not overnight, but over the 30 years, is there something uh, that fills that in? And you know, having an electric grid 
with incredible transmission, three times as big, all that wind and solar, that will be a, a gigantic uh, jobs creator as, as we get going on it. Yeah. yeah, it feels like it has to be the first step because now the, the last thing I want you to talk about technology-wise and where the innovation will be, and I, I'm not aware of it, is, is capturing it. So you point out, you know, in steel production, which every, every human in, in America is responsible for about 600 um, pounds of, of steel and cement individually. So that's how much we're using. Now, that thus far has been a, a huge uh, carbon dioxide emitter and, and, and currently how we're doing it, uh, it's going to continue to be. So what is the technology that is going to exist or is potentially going to happen that is going to capture the carbon during these process? And, and obviously electricity will have to be a huge component of being able to run that. Yeah, so we want to ideally change the way we do things so there are no emissions, uh, so that the electric car, you know, that battery uh, makes no emissions. The, there will be some things that we can't change. And for those, what we'll do is call direct air capture, where we'll have these big boxes that the wind blows through and they'll have a fan and they'll, they'll pull out of the air the CO2 molecules that are only 410 out of a million molecules in the air are the CO2, but uh, you know, as it blows that air through, uh, there's a way to grab it and then you pressurize it, it becomes a liquid and then you put it in a underground store where it's gotta stay uh, for ideally millions of years. That kind of direct air capture uh, will be the kind of cleanup thing for the things that just we have no other uh, approach for. That's very expensive today, $600 a ton. Uh, I think it will come down to $100 a ton. I hope that somebody surprises us uh, and gets it to be even cheaper. I'm funding a lot of these companies. Uh, Elon Musk just did a X Prize uh, for a company to uh, get these costs down in a significant way. So that's one of these uh, places we need lots of crazy, you know, wild uh, new approaches. I've seen uh, five or six and, uh, you know, usually have pretty high failure rates, but just one of, or two of those could bring the cost of that down a lot. And that would, that would take care of the entire set of things that you don't have uh, even cheaper ways of doing like we'll have with the electric car where we just never make the emissions in the first place. So $100 a ton, would that'd be $5.1 trillion to clean up our current emission. That, that's right, yeah, so 51 billion times 100, and that's way too much. I mean, somebody can say, okay, <laughs> hey, the world economy, you know, that's only like 7%, but uh, it's not gonna happen, and so, only through innovation that would bring that number down by about 95% to like 250 billion. Then I can see how between the rich countries and the middle income countries uh, and helping out the, the poorest countries that overall the planet could you know, reach this agreement. Hey, you know, if you don't go green, we'll uh, not trade with you. So we really need everyone uh, involved in making sure that this this disastrous heat increase uh, isn't continuing past 2050. Yeah, I guess I, my question on that topic is how do we get everyone on the same page? Because if we look at the pandemic as a kind of precursor of, of I, I mean, I was just telling Dax like in, in my life, and I think for a lot of people, like this is the first thing that's happened that feels truly global. like every single person is affected and you feel that you feel it on a day to day and climate disaster is the exact same thing i'm not sure we handled this great i don't think the dress rehearsal went great so <laughs> i how do we get people on the same page about this yeah that's a great question the pandemic uh it's awful you know trillions of dollars of economic costs uh you know, mental health, things that are hard to measure, 
you know, loss of education years, particularly in the inner city. You know, so a lot of the dimensions of inequity, the pandemic has just made worse. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel guilty almost that I have a nice house so I can work from home with lots of room. I have a great internet connection. The nature of my job is such that, uh, you know, I can sit and wave my hands in front of a computer screen all day. Uh, and now we, we should say, okay, how did we do? Well, we didn't do nearly as well as we should have. We didn't listen to the warnings in advance and make some investments. Uh, but the vaccine manufacturers who got uh, all but Pfizer got a lot of U.S. government money. That's the one thing that U.S. government, and it's a program called BARDA that had been in, put in place uh, over a decade ago. But it did fund that. Uh, and amazingly, the success rate of the vaccines is very high. You know, the first five are working quite well. Now, the variants mean we may have to tune uh, this a little bit, but we can see the end here uh, because of the vaccine work. So that's innovation at work, but that was innovation after uh, the, the problem hit us. And so you're right. Uh, the number of people speaking about the pandemic was too small. Um, and you know, even though I was very loud, uh, <laughs> and it's not much fun on that one to say, hey, I told you so, Jesus. Uh, you know, now, now the crazy people say that, you know, uh, I, I, I like it, but that that is dead wrong. Anyway, the you have a lot of conflicting uh, motives. But when I read the attacks, I'm like, well, wait, does this guy want to control everyone or kill everyone? I make up your mind. You can't do both. Well, they say they say I want to track people, but I haven't figured out why I do. Uh, somebody's <laughs> got to, I guess, <laughs> got to tell me what I'm going to do with all that information. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the serious piece here is that the commitment and advocacy on this one will have to be a million times greater than the voices in the wilderness who didn't uh, get heard relative to pandemic preparedness. This is a generational thing. No single philanthropist uh, can tackle some high percentage of this one. I mean, and it's great. We've got, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, myself, Elon. We've got lots of the companies now coming in on this. But it's really the voters will have to say, is this a priority? And so the advocates exposing people to, you know, these scary negative things, uh, we're going to have to get even better at that. Um, and I, you know, that advocacy creativity, I probably won't uh, be able to add much to it. So, you know, the creative community that you're part of, I, you know, I challenge them. Uh, there are things like this David Attenborough movie that showed, hey, nature looked even better back when he was a young man and now all this population growth means that a lot of those beautiful scenes from his youth, you go back and you say, wow, uh, those forests are gone, those coral reefs are dying. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to motivate people, uh, but, you know, this is the cause, uh, kind of in a sense, the ultimate cause uh, that we have to orchestrate humanity around. Okay, we're going to go to some audience questions, but before we do, you're going to have to listen to one more compliment. So... In regards to the pandemic, I think what really uh, hamstrung our response to it was it becoming politicized. I mean, it was the most disheartening thing to watch that your political party would dictate how you responded or thought about this it was so troubling. And I think likewise, this issue suffers from a similar uh, politicizing. And I think this book you've written uh, how to avoid a climate disaster is as straight up the middle as you can be. I think it's it's the the most bipartisan look at this. I think it's so pragmatic. I think it's practical. I think it's responsible economically and fiscally and morally. And I think you've somehow spanned that whole thing, and it's incredibly impressive. And genuinely, we are so grateful that you exist and that you're yeah. you we talk about you're, it all you're the bringing time. yes <laughs> uh, we really do that you're bringing everything you've created over your life to bear on these hard hard problems and thank God for you sincerely. Yeah. Um, now we'll have some audiences ask you um, what your favorite socks and shoes are. <laughs> that's, that's Perfect. <laughs> green. green. Katie. 
But we kind of talked about that. Oh, we talked about it. Okay, Mon Monica's making on the fly edits. <laughs> okay, sorry, Katie. As the I question's do. not going to be my scissors. Got my scissors out. <laughs> um, okay, uh, there's a question from Shira. She says, one of your podcast episodes with Rash Rashida Jones. Also, by the way, you were very jealous to hear you had a podcast. Uh, okay. We felt yeah. like we betrayed, and we don't like this question, but continue. <laughs> Sorry about that. We did a pretty good job. We would have thought you would ask us. But anyways. Uh... <laughs> kind of what we just touched on, but um, it, you could talk about whether people can really change, and do you think climate deniers will, will ever, ever change their mind? Is it a waste of time to think about converting them? Well, we do need uh, a lot of the younger generation, not 100%, to be familiar with climate change and to, to see those negatives. I mean, we have three types of people that are a problem. The denialists, and now that the uh, oil companies are not promoting that, you'll see that die down because the science is just super strong. There's a range of you know how quick the temperature goes up and how much you map that temperature into bad things, you know, and the high end of that range is super bad. Even the low end of the range is, is bad. But uh, uh, so the den you've got deniers, you've got people who think that it's going to be easy to solve. And uh, those are mostly the other political party. And they're, again, education, you know, talking through all the, the scale and sources uh, will help us there. And then you have people who think it's impossible and they're just like, oh, we give up, you know, let's go party uh, before this thing boils over. Uh -oh. uh, At the next jumper types? Okay. And <laughs> so all three of those camps uh, hold us back in the sense that we are asking for this huge level of engagement for this, this monumental task. And so along with the green premium, I agree it would be good to track attitudes towards climate change. Maybe that's the leading indicator of wh whether we're gonna get this done even more than my favorite number, which is that green premium uh, thing. But attitudes will lead on this. And, uh, you know, we're short, uh, you know, the science courses teaching this in a uh, fair way so that, you know, everyone who graduates kind of comes out saying, okay, I have that basic knowledge and I can argue over the tactics to get to the goal, but the goal seems, you know, like fighting a war or solving health problems to be something that shouldn't be partisan. We have to agree on who the enemy is. 51 <laughs> billion tons of carbon dioxide. Exactly. Okay, question number three is from an anonymous person. So this might be a little dicey. Uh, they wanted to remain We anonymous. obviously haven't pre-read these. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how are the roles of individuals, corporations, and governments different regarding climate change solutions? Well, the individual, that's where you get the, you know, buy an electric car if you can, uh, try out the uh, artificial uh, ground beef from people like Impossible and beyond. And there'll be lots of food products that are uh, low emission type products that the quality is getting better, the price is coming down. That's one sector where if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have put it up as high as cement and steel in terms of difficulty. But because a lot of these companies have come out, and even as they were offered in restaurants and grocery stores, the demand actually was uh, beyond what they expected. Uh, and so uh, as a consumer, you're buying the green products helps drive that uh, R&D budget and the improvement and, and the, the price going down. Uh, you know, educating other people where you get extra credit if you convince somebody who's not in your political party. Uh, uh, you know, of course you vote. Uh, and, you know, you're an employee uh, and these big companies, uh, they can reach, and when they build a new building by, you know, at least some green steel and cement, maybe all over time, uh, you know, the tech companies use, uh, electricity in their data centers. They can make sure there isn't any hydrocarbon ever used, not just net, but n you know, never used because they are pioneering customers of these storage uh, solutions that we need to scale up. And so, you know, we all play a lot of different roles. The government is huge. It's got to fund the R&D. It's got to create the tax credits. Uh, it's got to, you know, demand visibility that Nobody can hide their activities and these, these measures are there. 
so investors and customers can see all of that. And so it's good to see that, you know, the Biden administration is really, uh, you know, pushing this and, and picked very strong people uh, across many parts of the government. Yeah, and we need to be able to build coalitions uh, internationally to help everyone go in the same direction, which hopefully is starting to happen. Uh, um, David and Darcy? I'm going to ask one from Second Anonymous. Oh, okay, great, great. I'm great. hopping around. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> Hops down. Uh, what is the coolest climate change innovation or technology? I like this. Well, one that uh, I don't know if we'll achieve, but would solve a lot of problems if we could, is being able to make hydrogen uh, in a clean way, so call it green hydrogen, and make that super cheap. Uh, that would help with many of the manufacturing problems because you know you could make steel where it's actually the hydrogen that does the work of taking the iron ore and converting it to uh, the metal. And, you know, when you make fertilizer right now, you use natural gas. So there's a, a, a kind of a cool level of activity now where people are looking at, okay, how could you do that? Can we get that price done down enough? And it'll start out with a high green premium, but if you get the volume up, then these uh, components that they use called electrolyzers, those could get extremely cheap. And uh, so I'm enthused. There's a lot of talk uh, about uh, doing that. And that wasn't there three or four years ago. Um, you know, and the number of cool companies is large. Breakthrough Energy, in our first fund, we have 40. We just started our second fund where the candidates for our second 40 look very, very strong. Uh, in the first fund, we got a lot of storage and food. So in the second fund, we're looking at that direct air capture, this the green hydrogen I mentioned uh, and the, uh, work on aviation fuel. Is when, what's the timeline for fusion? Well, fusion is a wild card because the science isn't well understood. Basically, if you get hydrogen up at a ridiculous temperature, 10 million degrees, then it bounces around so fast that even though it kind of repels electrically, it still uh, runs into each other, and that's what the sun is doing. And when they do hit each other, that releases energy. It, they combine to make helium, but there's energy left over, uh, and that you know that's why the sun does a good job uh, heating us up. And so it's doing that right now. We do that with hydrogen bombs. We don't want that. Uh, that's sort of an uncontrolled uh, fusion mm -hmm. reaction. There are about 13 companies, but. Uh, that's one where I say I'd be very surprised if by 2050 that's a significant piece. Now, there's people working on that. Breakthrough Energy is invested in one of those. Uh, we track them. But it's not mature like fission is, where you take a big thing like uranium, and when it breaks in two, it releases a lot of energy. So fission is what all the electric power reactors have been, although we're talking now about uh, designing that from scratch in a cheaper, safer way. Uh, fusion, we've done experiments, but we're not even at the energy break even level yet because it takes energy to make those insane temperatures. Yeah. Um, okay. Anonymous wants to know what's one thing that helps you stay optimistic about the state of the world right now? And if you're optimistic, they want to know why are you so delusional? That's what <laughs> that is right. Well, Okay. Yeah, okay, the pandemic is a huge setback. So let me just uh, plead that, yes, uh, you know, that for some issues is a two-year setback, for some it's a five-year, some it's a 10-year setback. But for, before the pandemic, you know, we were uh, making progress on reducing childhood deaths. You know, we'd cut it in half since the year 2000. We were more aware of uh, you know, gender inequality, uh, you know, the George, George Floyd incidents has made us, you know, redouble our efforts that look at all these uh, people of color and how, you know, the outcomes for them, whether it's jobs or income or uh, health, you know, just aren't, aren't as good as we'd expect they would be. And so when society gets upset about something, uh, you know, we, we focus on it and, 
uh, we make progress. Sometimes it's social awareness that we uh, have uh, better values. Sometimes it's innovation. You know, without electricity, it'd be hard uh, to have the civilization that we have today. And so I get to work in the digital world, uh, which, you know, it's mostly good news that that uh, is moving so fast. I get to work in the health world uh, where progress on things like cancer and malaria, you know, finally getting rid of polio, uh, all those things are in our, our future. And so there's a lot to feel good about while uh, we still, you know, are, are disappointed about the inequality and uh, difficulties that remain. Yeah, just you've seen firsthand progress and you've been a part of it and you had big ideas that ended up happening. So I think that leads to optimism. He's in a closed feedback loop, positive closed He's in my feedback. desk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a, a provocative question you don't like. I've been blowing a lot of smoke this whole time, but <laughs> has it crossed your mind, what if you're Paul Ehrlich? What if this warming opens up all this fertile land in the Northern Hemisphere and everything's honky-dory? Has that crossed your mind? That's from Anonymous, not from That's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's crazy. Uh, the... Uh, the most of humanity lives in either tropic zones, uh, tropical zones or temperate zones. And so the idea that, okay, the way we'll deal with this is we'll move everybody to Siberia or, you know, near the Arctic Circle, that's just not going to work. That is countries, you know, that type of mass movement, uh, you know, won't work. It is true that the suffering, uh, the further north you are, will be less. Uh, and... And yet, you know, our overall ability to make food and, uh, you know, to have stable countries, there is no, hey, let's just abandon the equatorial regions uh, that works out for this. Uh, we've got to preserve those tropical forests. We've got to make those areas livable. You know, India alone, you know, is 1.4 billion people. And that, uh, if we don't act by the end of the century, their farming output will be so reduced that they will be facing starvation, which is what Paul Ehrlich predicted before the Green Revolution and the reduction in uh, family birth rate uh, made his prediction foolish, which was super good news uh, that that negative view turned out to be wrong. We need again to you know, help uh, families in Africa where most of the population growth is have uh, access to birth control, uh, and improve their lives where families voluntarily decide to have smaller family size. And we need to make sure they have enough to, to on their farm that they're not feeling like they have to move. So, you know, wholesale transportation isn't going to get us out of this one. Okay. I should not be investing in Canadian real estate. Is that in your... <laughs> well, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, may, maybe Siberia. <laughs> um, we have one last question from the audience and it is from Elaine and she wants to know if will eliminating fossil fuels entirely become prohibitively expensive for the average person or household that's that's a very very good question uh, if we just said today that everyone has to use green products the impact at the household level would be gigantic. You know, we don't even have the capacity to make them, so they'd be in short supply and, you know, the prices would go up, it would be, you know, super inflationary. And so uh, even in the US, doing this kind of brute force, um, you know, is not the solution. You know, I can afford to pay for uh, gold standard carbon offsets like direct air capture, you know, so that I'm at zero, but you know, that's many millions of dollars for that green aviation fuel and all the things that get that get me there. And so it's not a scalable way uh, to, to solve this problem. So, you know, if you told me we couldn't innovate, I, I would join the, hey, it's impossible, I'm pessimistic crowd. But then again, you know, if you look at human life today versus 200 years ago, that's a story of innovation. If you look at the work I was lucky enough to be part of at Microsoft, you know, we exceeded any expectation. Likewise, at the Gates Foundation, 
you know, we knew we wanted to reduce childhood deaths with our partners, but the fact we were able to get it from 10 million to 5 million, I wouldn't have expected that. You know, we got new vaccines done, we got them out. Uh, so when things go well, they don't somehow get as much attention. You know, like once we get rid of polio, uh, people are, are not going to go around saying, hey, where are the, the people who got polio? They just won't even think about it, which, okay, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, things, the absolute progress we've made and that with the right focus we will make on climate uh, always uh, is wondrous to me. Well, um, I think your way of looking at things must include how holistic the situation is. So, yes, if your kid does not have <clears throat> clean diapers, guess what you don't care about? The temperature in 2050. So as you, it all is working together, right? Like if, if, you're, if you're, you're solving these really pressing and immediate problems for people, that then clears the path to worry about some of more long-term issues. Yeah, and, and governments and people who are lucky enough uh, to have uh, wealth like I do, you know, it's up to us. We have kind of a responsibility to think about those long-term scenarios uh, and, you know, invest in them and uh, really, you know, figure out the science, uh, what, why that's happening and, and how to avoid it. Uh, and, you know, I see the early stages of that coming together with both governments and individuals. I have a quick last personal question. Um, I just moved, bought a house and some, and I want to make it eco-friendly, as eco-friendly as possible. So what's like the one thing that if someone's moving into a house or building a house that they should prioritize? Uh, yeah, there, I'll mention two. Your heating and cooling, you should use what's called an electric heat pump. It, it, uh, it connects to the electricity, which will be green. And then in some jurisdictions, uh, the incentives and the weather are such that putting solar panels on your roof uh, is a very good investment. In California, it tends to be uh, a very good investment in a few other states. But this electric heat pump thing, unless you're in the very coldest parts of the, the U.S., uh, it works phenomenally well. Okay, great. So first I knew that we both love Diet Coke, and now I know that we both say roof. <laughs> this could be the foundation of the best friendship. I want you to be my Warren Buffett. The invitation has been put on your table. You accept it or not. But I think just those two things, if we're pounding some Diet Cokes and saying roof. <laughs> that's all you need. That's a lot. That's a no, lot. We have that. I, I mispronounce other words too. But yeah, uh, I look forward to having a Diet Coke together when the, the pandemic's over. Us too. Um such a pleasure to get to talk to you about this book. I genuinely loved it, and it genuinely converted me. I, uh, I it felt felt overwhelming. It felt not realistic uh, that no one was really evaluating what it's going to take, what the realities of all this are, and it's all there. And how to avoid climate disaster. I hope so many people read it and get motivated. And it's digestible. Yeah, it's very digestible. It is not a dense. Yeah, you go into book. one like oh, I, Bill Gates wrote it. I won't understand the damn yeah. thing. But it's kind of like uh, how to avoid for dummies. You know, you did a good job at making it for the layman. No, the four dummies books are actually very good. I hope I, I rose to that standard. Yeah, we try to keep it short, but uh, it's it's fun. And cow farts and burps are in it <laughs> excessively more than even needed. <laughs> and you just do a great job at breaking down some, you know, really basic understanding of how all these things are created and, and uh, consumed. And uh, it's just perfect. And uh, I hope everyone gets it and reads it and gives it to a, uh, a family member of another political persuasion at Thanksgiving and all hell breaks loose, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bill. Yeah. And thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival. Festival. Yeah, great to see you guys. Good job.